certain that this uh, wood, a, a circular piece of wood, and drilled holes, and I arranged it so this would step along and drop one piece out every time. It just happened there was a spindle on that piece of wood, and I left it on. And then it occurred to me after I began to get uh, records of how fast the animal was was working for food, uh, the marks like this, and it occurred to me if I put a string around that spindle, I could have the pen drop and get a curve. Well, now that is just that is extraordinary luck because it is the curve from which the slope is a measure of probability or rate of responding. It proved to be so, certainly in my own thinking, very important. Well, that was, that's gadgetry. It is due to uh, my building things. If I were sitting around like Wittgenstein uh, playing with words or whatever he played with, uh, uh, it would be a very different thing, of course. Wittgenstein did say at one point, you know, that it will take some animal research to answer these questions. I value that. When, when you were saying that um, uh, there is not much use in teaching all those years of Latin to uh, little kids, I was thinking that a, that, a gra that a grammar school system that produced Shakespeare can't be all wrong. to get on the verbal behavior yes, pretty soon, I don't you think? Yes, I was thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've come this far in the discussion, and we are supposed to be talking about verbal behavior, and yet I haven't uh, asked you to explain your definition of verbal behavior and how it differs from nonverbal behavior. Could you do that for us? Uh, yes. First, however, I, I want to correct you. You said uh, my book was about verbal behavior or language. Now, in the book, I define a language as a verbal culture. It is people speaking, text, read, and so on, which alter the behavior of, of speakers. Uh, language, English, English language is not saying anything, not speaking. I do speak English. In other words, what I say is verbal behavior has been shaped by English as a verbal environment. Uh, when I speak French, that has been shaped by, alas, not the French environment, but book learning and so on. Uh, the languages are on the side of the reinforcing contingencies. And when you study language, you study current practices in the verbal community, which is not speaking at all, but reinforcing speaking. And that is why linguists have so often confined themselves almost entirely to the behavior of the listener. Uh, Chomsky and others, is this, is this a grammatical sentence? That's not a question about verbal behavior. It's a question about the listener or the reader. Is, that, is a listener or a reader responding effectively to that particular verbal pattern? And so they begin to reanalyze the structure of the language. And that is structuralism of, of the worst kind. Uh, meanwhile, someone has had to be speaking, and that is the product of what listeners have done over years of, uh, of contact with the speaker. The verbal behavior is behavior. A language is the word for a verbal environment, and it is studied as such, and it has always been studied as such by linguists. There are all the languages in the world. That doesn't mean all of the verbal behavior that's been going on. It means these are the cultures which have shaped different kinds of verbal behavior. Now, verbal behavior is what I'm doing right now. I'm making noises. 
and I'm making the noises which have had certain kinds of consequences. The first time I said Dada, my father was in ecstasy, I dare say. Oh, he called me Dada. And so I was hugged and uh, given all sorts of goodies and so on. And ever since, I went on calling him Dada or Daddy. Actually, it was Papa, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's not quite so easy for a child to say Papa, apparently. But anyway, the, my whole repertoire has been shaped by the kinds of consequences that have followed. And those kinds of consequences are the things which have created general principles to all languages. The fact that there are universals we've made a great deal of, that all languages have certain common features. Of course they have, because there are common reasons why people have reinforced my behaviors in these various ways. And there are, in all languages, there are questions. Uh, what did you say? Uh, or what is that? In all languages, there are negations. Uh, no, not that. Um, in all languages, there are things talked about. <laughs> there are actions talked about, and so on and so on. Um, these are the universals, because they are the universals of the contingencies of reinforcement responsible for verbal behavior, not any one particular set, such as Greek or Latin or, or French or English. What's the definition, then, of verbal, be of verbal behavior? Well, verbal, verbal behavior is behavior which differs from nonverbal behavior in the nature of its reinforcement. If I touch that glass and pick it up, I've got a glass in my hand. And I could have done that if there had been glasses before the species ever acquired verbal behavior. If I say, hand me that glass, please, and someone hands it to me, I, my, reins, my response, hand me that glass, is reinforced by someone else. Now that reaching and picking that up shapes some very specific muscles in my hand and some related to some thick stimuli from, from the glass to my eyes and so on. Nothing of that sort is involved if I say, hand me the glass, please. Uh, so my verbal behavior is going to be very different. It is shaping my muscles here in different patterns, but only in ways which have produced certain consequences in a quite different way. So the behavior shaped by contingencies of reinforcement like that as, as one kind of thing, the behavior of vocal behavior shaped by consequences will be very different. And that is why uh, my book simply traces all of the differences between verbal behavior and nonverbal behavior which come from that distinction. And the fact that the reinforcers are mediated somebody some of the else, behavior Somebody by the else behavior. was supposed to be in there. No, no solitary person ever began to talk. Mm -hmm. Is the behavior of the listener verbal then? I would say no, uh, except when you are speaking along with the speaker. And we do that a great deal. Uh, if we hear people sing the Star Spangled Banner before a ball game, we're probably saying it along with what we're hearing, mm -hmm. if we are very loyal people. Um, and when we read a poem we know very well, we are saying it, saying it along with with the speaker, the, uh, if, um, even though he may be dead for several hundred years, uh, he said it, and, and in reading it, you are saying it. You're not just responding to it. The first time you responded to it, you had no, no cues to, to lead you to say it yourself. First time you read a poem, you word after word, but after that, if you heard this and done this a thousand times, you're ahead of the text, and the text is prompting, and you may forget it and just recite the poem. Then you, then you are the listener, who, the reader who is saying it. I'm going to come back to the question of the, list, the speaker and the listener. All right. Uh, you may remember that it has puzzled me for some time. 
many people would 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 say I probably you you and I would agree that the, the what the listener does is every bit as complicated as what the speaker does. But you're saying that it's of a in what way is it different except for not making noise? Well, the the listener is responding to stimuli. For example, I'm a cook, and I, and I either ring the triangular bell, chow is ready, or I just call out, chow. Now, what's the difference between coming to the bell or coming to the, uh, the sounds I make? Both are verbal, though, because I don't ring bells unless people do come. But on the side of the listener, it's no more verbal than coming when the tea kettle whistles. You, you uh, do respond to one thing because something else has accompanied it in the past. And I don't see uh, verbal, uh, I don't see listeners doing things that they don't do in nonverbal environments. They may not be doing things, I mean, picking up a glass and handing it to you, mm -hmm. uh, I could do, as mm -hmm. you say, whether or not you had asked for the glass of water. Yeah. But it's all, the argument is often made uh, by psycholinguists that we're dealing with, with, quotes, language in two forms, the productive side, the, re the receptive side, um, or the comprehension side. If, if you as you do, speak in long, complicated, academic sentences, yeah. um, I have to, quote, process that stream of sound to make sense of it. You have been af affected by cognitive psychology. So are you processing? What does that mean? Are you grinding wheat? Are you dis distilling oil? What, what is this process? Um, you are doing something, yes, and I can. If I have to, I, if I don't start with you now to discover this, if I start with you as a small child uh, whose mother said dinner is ready, and you came, and or she said stop doing that, and you stopped. You you learn to do, you learn to stop doing in response to stimuli, which would be just as much as. Uh, not touching something if it's hot, or, or picking something up when it looks appetizing, and so on. You are responding to stimuli in terms of what has happened to you when you responded to them in the past. And that's not verbal behavior. It happens to be verbal stimuli because they were produced by a speaker, but that doesn't, mean, that doesn't make any difference in what you're doing, in the nature of what you're doing. Well, then, uh whether we call it verbal or not. Let's, let's confine the term verbal to that which the speaker well, does. Well, I think the speaker is very, imp the listener is very important. Yeah. I have, have a paper I gave at Arbo last uh, year on the, on the behavior of the listener. I think it needs to be looked at very closely, and I may have neglected it a bit in my book, but I was talking about verbal behavior, which is the behavior of the speaker. I was assuming the kinds of consequences that shape that behavior. Um. We haven't yet to come to talking about uh, a new field of research that has risen in the last couple of decades on the verbal capacities of non-human species. Yes. You and your associates taught a small bit of verbal behavior to two mm. pigeons. Irene Pepperberg is teaching verbal skills to a parrot. Lewis Herman to dolphins. Ron Schusterman to sea lions. I've taught a dozen verbal responses to a monkey and several exceptionally dedicated research teams have taught extensive verbal repertoires to some chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. What do you think of this work? Can it teach us anything basic about verbal behavior, or do you think it's just a demonstration of our animal training skills? Well, I have always supposed that other species can engage in verbal behavior. And I think you could say that my book proves it if the book is a valid account, because in it I discuss a wide range of kinds of verbal behavior, from poetry to logic to military command.